and, and welcome to the international seminar and CSW 66 <laughs> meeting and, and side event. Thank you very much for your participation, for your patience and, and for, for, for being a supportive and collaborative and being here. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Professor Huria Tokar. Uh, I'm the director of the Yasha University Women Research Center. Uh, which is located in Izmir in Turkey. And, and today we have a guest speakers from United States, Sierra Leone, Turkey, and, and many different parts of uh, the countries and even in Turkey, many different cities. And, and thank you all for being here and online and for your contribution. We will discuss ecofeminism and gender equality today. The topic is that one. So we have at least six partner organizations a uh, little bit later and, and Fatma uh, Hanım will give us more information and, and so we have a, a great um, women NGOs and many organizations behind this event. I just want to share with that information as well. So let me introduce you with, with Fatma Aytaç, who is the, um, uh, from Red Pepper Association and the most hardworking woman from the NGO side of the world, I can say at least. Thank you very much for your participation and for your uh, actual inspiration to take us behind this uh, event. Thank you, Fatma Hanım. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Huri uh, Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Huri said, I am Fatma Itaç, chairwoman of Kırmızı Biber Derneği in Turkish, Red Paper Association in English. And it is my honor to, uh, to be with you today to host this event and have you distinguished speakers and the moderation. Kırmızı Biber Derneği, Red Paper Association in English, is a non-governmental organization uh, striving equal representation of women in decision points, especially in politics, advocating uh, women and girls' rights, LGBTIQ plus rights, uh, struggling for a world where there is no violence against women and uh, where all kinds of discrimination is eliminated, taking responsibility for a livable world for everyone by supporting democracy and representation on all demographic groups. Uh, Red Paper Association is United Nations Economic and Social Council uh, the other name, ECOSOC, accredited since 2017. Uh, that is why we are having this event. Uh, we are making the events in CSW period every year. Uh, the association is a member of uh, the independent women's movement of Turkey. We are very proud of it. Uh, let me name uh, them. Uh, Eşik Platform, Women's Plan Platform for Equality, Women's Coalition, Kadın Koalisyonu, as well as the member of U.S. Women's Caucus at UN and CSW Caucus. Uh, this year, CSW theme is achieving gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk redu reduction policies and programs, uh, we can say in short, gender equality in the context of climate change. Let me say, say a few words for climate change uh, before passing the floor to uh, moderation. Climate change is a gender problem. Uh, increasing uh, existing inequalities, uh, which disproportionately affects women and girls, as well as other marginalized groups. It is not an isolated issue than the bigger context of social and economic justice, feminism and intersectionality, and even decolonialism. Women are the most dependent uh, to the natural resources, which are most threatened by the climate change. So the climate change increases women and girls' vulnerability. I want to take Thank all the speakers and all the participants uh, being with us today. And a special thank to Etkinis, the RBA for sponsor, uh, sponsoring this, this event. Now I will leave the floor to Professor Huriye Toker for moderation. Floor is yours, Huriye Hocam. 
Thank you very much, uh, Fatma Hanım. Uh, really, it's a great honor to, to have everybody here. Actually, the topic is gender equality and ecofeminism, as we uh, said that it's emerged from 1970s, but right now we are debating more, we are trying to understand it more, we are trying to struggle because every day we are facing the issues related with these two inequalities, actually. So um, uh, we, we, today we will try to understand how the gender inequalities intersect with the er er environmental crisis, how it is affecting every day of our lives. We will talk about it, learn about it. Thank you uh, and we will uh, listen to the ecofeminist participants which will lead our way and to create more equitable societies so we believe we can do it we believe we can manage it all together as we are here today with that uh, reason we are here today and uh, let me introduce you with my first um, speaker thank you and uh, professor Paige West let me um, just briefly uh, just voice her uh, short bio. And Professor v uh, Paige West is an endowed professor of anthropology, writer, and director for the, um, for the Center of the Study of Social Difference at Columbia University. Equally de dedicated to scholarship, mentoring, and collaboration, Paige West is the author of three books and the founder of the journal Environmental and Society advances in research. So she is the co-founder of the PNG Institute of Biological Research and Romania Solware School, two conserv conservation focused on NGOs in Papua New Guinea. So she is the recipient of Guggenheim Fellowship as well. Thank you, Professor West, and the floor is yours. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming today. And thank you to my wonderful hosts for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to hope that the tech works for us today. And from beginning. Here we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, great. So many of you may be wondering why in the world someone who works in Oceania is at an event today that is sponsored by the Red Pepper Foundation and that is thinking about ecofeminism with a group of wonderful colleagues from Turkey. I work in Oceania specifically on the island of New Guinea. New Guinea is the second largest island in the world. It sits in the middle of the Western Pacific, the Western Pacific Warm Pool, which I'll come back to in a second. And very specifically, I work in the nation state of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is a parliamentary democracy that has had independence since 1975. You can see the provinces listed here. It's a wonderful place that I'll answer lots of questions about. Very specifically in Papua New Guinea, I have two field sites. One is a terrestrial field site in the highlands of the country. One is in New Ireland province, and that's one I'm gonna focus on today, although this talk I'm giving kind of stretches across not just Papua New Guinea, but also the entirety of Oceania, my big field of study. So New Ireland province is what we think of as a marine province. This means that it is off of the mainland of the island of New Guinea, and it is a place with 150,000 residents. They speak 18 different languages. It's important to note that Papua New Guinea is the most linguistically diverse place on our planet. The country has over 800 different languages. How do people communicate? Well, lots of people there speak about five languages. They speak across the languages adjacent to their own. They also speak Melanesian talk Pisan, which is a Creole language, and many people speak English. In my work, I either work in a local language or in Melanesian uh, talk Pisan, sometimes in English. New Ireland province, in addition to having 18 different languages, has a bunch of different island groups. So you have everything from the big island of New Ireland to all of these groups like the St. Matthias group, the Tabar group, and others. One of the things to know about this place is that there's a history of internal migration across the region. When we think about this region, think about Pacific seafarers, think about people that settled the region 50,000 years ago, and then a second migration 3,000 years ago. These are people that move around. They know how to use the ocean. Apili Huafa, who is a famous Melanesian scholar, talked about this being a place where the ocean was, is within people. The ocean is what connects people. 
So when we think about climate change in this part of the world, the first thing many of us think about is sea level rise. This is a place where lots of people live on small islands and atolls that are fringed with coral reefs that have a maximum elevation of about three to five meters and a mean elevation of one to two meters. Many of these places are very low lying. And sea level in the Western Pacific Ocean has been increasing at an alarming rate since about 1990. And there are lots of studies. I can provide some citations after my talk if you'd like. One of the things to think about in this part of the world, and so this is a bad slide, but you see the sea level rise between 1993 and 2010. New Guinea is directly above Australia, and you can see how much worse it is there in other places. People in the region say 1.5 to stay alive. Many of you have heard that in connection with events at the United Nations. 2012, the United States National Climate Assessment provided a global sea level rise scenario set, and most of them said, and this is again 2012, that we're looking at 0.2 to 2.0 meters. We now know this was a massive understatement. So we are thinking about a place in the world where without it staying at 1.5, people are going to have to move, they're already moving, and they're gonna be masses of numbers of internal and external migrants. So what's causing sea level rise in Oceania? Well, we all know this, not anything that people in Oceania are doing. What's causing it is overconsumption in the global north. Sea level rise is due to the melting of the continental ice sheets, the glaciers, and the expansion of seawater in sort of thermal expansion. All of this is tied to overconsumption and to the use of fossil fuels, again, not happening in Oceania. Sea level rise and other kinds of, sea level rise is exacerbated by other kinds of hazards. Um, connected to climate change and it exacerbates those. So we see across the region more frequent storms, more severe storms, more destructive waves, more destructive keen tides, tsunamis, higher temperatures, more rain. We also see major damage to infrastructure, to freshwater supplies, and to agriculture, and to the habitats of threatened and endangered species. It's very important to note that across Oceania, 97% of the people there depend on fish for their subsistence. So without healthy oceans, without oceans that are at a certain temperature, people can't feed themselves. People are losing the places that they've made their homes for a generation. They're being forced to relocate and start all over again. As they move, they lose their land, they lose their connections to everything it represents. And future generations are not going to be able to experience their culture in the same way. There are also cascading effects that we all know about when you have these exacerbated effects that are connected to climate change and sea level rise. There are all sorts of other things that get mixed in with them. Particularly, we can think about the effects of climate change in parallel to the COVID crisis. We can think about the effects of climate change and things like gender-based violence. When those things intersect, there are lots of people that are feeling the effects of everything. Modeling shows that many of these places are going to be drastically affected in the future, but they are already being affected now. So the people I work with in New Ireland are already moving. They're already moving because of climate disasters. And this is where I wanna to think together with you all as my colleagues in Turkey, or mostly in Turkey and who think about Turkey, because as we know, you all are the host to more migrants and more refugees than anyone else in the world. So let's step back for a second and let's think about global migration. So 84 million, and these are numbers from 2021 before the current crisis in migration that we have from, uh, from Ukraine. 87 million people forcibly displaced worldwide, 48 million are internally displaced, 4.4 million are asylum seekers, 26.6 million are refugees. Women, children, and families are affected by internal migration and external migration in extraordinary ways. We all know this. One of the things that I do as a scholar is political ecology. I'm an anthropologist by training, but political ecology is a field of study that is interdisciplinary. It brings together work from anthropology, sociology, history, ecology, political science and economics to ask questions about events that are seemingly environmental in nature and ask what's the causality for these events. There's a kind of notion that 
things happen because the environment changes. Political ecology for a long time now has said, well, let's step back from that and let's think about the political, economic, and social causes for environmental disasters and for other kinds of environmental changes. The other thing political ecology does is think about the variegated effects of disasters. And I, as a political ecologist, think about the way in which environmental disasters work at different kinds of intersections when it comes to effects. And we can look at the data and we see that women and children are affected more drastically by climate related events. They're affected more drastically by food shortages. They're affected more drastically by disease. When all of these things come together and people are forced to migrate, we have a situation where women and children bear the burden of many of these events that are caused by global political economic configurations. One of the things that I think needs to happen is I think there needs to be more discussion across diversity. I think there needs to be collaboration and discussion across difference. I think that women in Turkey need to be talking to women in Papua New Guinea. I think women in Papua New Guinea and Turkey need to be talking to women in say Nicaragua. I think that all of those women need to be talking to women who live in China. I think right now there is still a notion that because many of the negotiations around climate change happen at the, the state level, at the national level between nation states, that solidarities and agreements will happen at that level. What I would love to see moving forward is a conversation about solidarity across difference that really gets people talking together. And in particular, I think we're at a place with this wonderful technology. You know, none of us wanted this technology, none of us wanted COVID to happen, but we now have technology where we can do this, where we can get NGOs together and where we can have actual kind of incredible conversations through the translating apps, through the kind of multimodal platforms that we have, and we can get NGOs talking because I believe that some of the most important work about this is being done at the level of the NGO. And I'm gonna talk really briefly about an NGO that is dear to my heart in Papua New Guinea. It's called Islands Awareness. And at Islands Awareness, it was founded by John Eine, who is from New Ireland province. He's from Lavangai Island. Um, John took this wonderful picture. He's been my research partner for about 15 years. Um, his NGO thinks about what does it mean to transform lives in the wake of climate change in a way where people still have sovereignty over their own future? And so what I'd really like is to think about solidarity and sovereignty across difference. And I'd love to do it with you all and with others in the audience. And just thank you so much. I'll just voice my uh, uh, thank you, dear uh, professor. I uh, I just got speechless because actually you just gave voice what we are facing, what we are going through actually with own words, with the visuals and with, with the reality and implementations. What what we are having and facing, you just told us the reality. Actually, thank you very much, and especially you 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 just told us uh, not just. Papua New Guinea, not just Oceania, you just told us the reality of all, all uh, which is uh, concerning for everybody, for the whole universe, actually. And, and, and also you uh, just call us grassroots action, urgent grassroots action and communication uh, um, beyond the countries, beyond the nationalities. Thank you very much. And, and now, uh, right now, I would like to move on um, uh, Suheila Doan, and thank you, Professor West. Suheila Doan was born in Arba Tokat in 1957. She studied civil engineering at Middle East University. She is retired from state sector and moved to a village near Chanakkale, as everybody wants it, and, and living there for 20 years. She is a volunteer of Eshik Platform, Women's Platform for Equality, Suheila Doan is one of the spokeswomen of Union of Ecology and member of the Assembly of Women of Union of Ecology. And she is married, has one daughter and a grandson. 
And floor is yours, Suheila, dear Suheila Doan. Welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you, Huriye Hoca. Uh, herkese merhaba. Konuşmayı ana dilimde yapmayı tercih edeceğim. Çeviri olan ağımız var diye. Hazır çeviri varken zorlamayalım dilimizi diye. Herkese çok sevgi ve selamlar. Kendimi yine bir kız kardeş, yoldaş ortamında buldum. Tanıdığımız sevgili dostlarımız bu süre ortamdan. Ve bu sefer dünyanın çeşitli yerlerinden de kadınlar... I have friends from all across the world. So it's a great pleasure to be with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Evet, e, biraz iklim krizinden, ekofeminizmden sonra da iklim adaletini sağlamak için. I'll be, I will be talking about climate, climate crisis and what we need to do in, in respect of ecofeminism as well. I will be walking you through basically ecofeminism, but my presentation is not moving as I see my slides are not moving. So I will be starting with the trunk of a the body of a plane tree. It looks like a body of a woman, as you can see. So the tree is similar to a woman. And let me put it that way. Patriarchal system, including the thermal power plants and, and industrial production, geothermal power plants, and hydroelectric power plants, all of them, when they're considered together and coupled with industrial husbandry and, and so-called wind farms and mega projects, the bridges and roads, all of them are destructing and degrading the whole world and bringing about a very huge ecological degradation and bringing about huge emissions of um, greenhouse gas emissions. So all these industrial activities husbandry, animal husbandry, livestock activities and and agricultural activities are leading to global warming dear, and global dear Suheyla, warming. Uh, dear Suheyla Doğan, the, the uh, visuals are not just flowing. Uh, do we need to do anything or, or is it uh, something is uh, the visuals are not just going through? I just want to remind it. Really? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I just, is it moving? Not yet. Uh, Not yet. No. Suheyl, Suheylacığım, altta bir tane şey işareti var ya. E, Suheyla, sağ... there is this, there is this, like screen button. Well, okay, stop sharing your screen and reshare your screen if you could kindly. Okay. What if I do not use it in full screen? It is up to you. You can do it in full screen or, or like like this. Let me try again, if I may, very quickly. How about now? Are they moving? Are the slides moving? No, they're not. If you click on the slide, maybe it'll start moving. No, it's not moving. It's not working, no. I don't know how to go about this. What about you? do it manually Suheyla, professor Suheyla. like you can click on the slides one by one so that they can move properly i was thinking you can you can put it in share screen once you put it in share screen there will be the screen that you're going to see and you should go for the option at the top what about this one? Yes, we got it. I guess we did it. I think we did it. But still, I can't move my slides. It may be working out on your side, but it's not moving on my side, says Suheyla. <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> Normally it works, you know. Today it's not working. Maybe because we're so crowded today. What if I do it this way? What if I do it this way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we got it now. Uh, is least, it working? Uh, this fun, wonderful uh, we can see. tree is, yeah, we can see the wonderful tree. Okay, Osman, uh, I will go one by one <laughs> without whole screen. I am sorry. 
for it. It's okay. Evet. Uh... Okay, let me resume. Let me repeat some of the statements I made earlier. Capitalism, energy mining, mining, every type of mining, energy investments, lots of mega projects over there in relation to industrial, animal husbandry, livestock production, agricultural production, all of them are making the life a hell, um, turning the life into a hell. This is why we are encountering this climate crisis nowadays. The mining activities and depletion of the water resources, degradation of the nature. I'd like to show you a couple of uh, pictures of all these natural degradation. This natural degradation. You can see the acidic water and also acidic acidic drainage caused by mining, mining activities, coal mining activities, as well as deforestation. You can see this one is Kirazla district, actually. There was a huge uh, deforestation because of the felling of 347,000 trees um, in, uh, over some period of time. As a result of all these activities, we encountered a very big um, climate crisis nowadays and bringing about um, extreme weathers, you know, cold weathers, hot weathers. You can see, you know, sunny, is sh sunny weather in the morning and you can encounter very, very cold weather in the, in the afternoon. You can see wild winds and storms, storms that you couldn't see, you know, years ago in Turkey. We uh, come up against those extreme weather, weather conditions in Turkey and the frequency of these extreme weather conditions uh, is becoming so high. Uh, in in recent years, as a result, we um, we're going through we're going through a lot of um, floods, and floods. I'm sorry, floods and, and natural disasters and and wildfires and water scarcity, and less productivity in agriculture, and also COVID nineteen. You know, this is a type of crisis. Uh, in addition to loss of biodiversity, we are also encountering loss of biodiversity, deforestation, land degradation, natural uh, degradation, and, and, and a huge loss of biodiversity we are up against nowadays. And biodiversity loss is a huge um, danger, by the way, as mentioned by Paige earlier. As a result of all these activities and all these effects, we come across uh, disasters and, and, and migration and 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 the many other many others nowadays these are all effects of the extreme events and other others that i earlier listed but we have been combating them all you're not just standing idly by but we are struggling putting up a struggle against these climate crises and you can see a picture from turkey turkish people putting up a fight against climate crisis and we're also being oppressed when we are putting up a struggle against climate crisis people are killed they're oppressed they're killed they're detained a lot of life advocates in Turkey uh, have lost their lives when they're struggling for life in Turkey. And, you know, effects of and impact of climate change and, and, and climate crisis are not balanced around the globe. We have the rich countries over the north and we have the poor countries uh, to the south and which are impacted the most by the impacts of the climate crisis, I have to say. The poor, pe poor people, poor nations are being impacted the most, especially to the south of the world, uh, by this, by these impacts of climate crisis. We know who caused the climate crisis, and we know who is impacted the mo most by this crisis, the climate crisis. And most impo important, the women and children, they are more affected by the climate change or, or the disasters brought about by climate change, including extreme weather events and the whirlwinds and storms and all the others. Because women are impacted more, 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 more negatively. We need a we need a gendered lens to look at this issue. We need a feminist approach and feminist lens that we need to put on. This is why we need this eco-feminism approach that we're adopting all of us in this school today. You know, for years, women have been putting up a fight and struggle against gender inequality uh, under the platform of Eshik. Um, and, and, and on the other platforms, we have a lot of associations, NGOs, uh, through which we have been putting up a fight against this uh, patriarchal system. 
and uh, capital capitalist system. You know, this capitalist patriarchal system is oppressing women as well as the nature. And this this approach is considering nature to be just a commodity, to be exploited, just stay with the women, I have to admit. Every day, many women are killed around the globe. And at the same time, trees are killed. Nature is killed around the globe um, every minute on, on Earth. So on one hand, women are putting up a fight against gender inequality, and they're also putting up a fight against uh, natural degradation, degradation of nature. And we call these two combined as eco-feminism. You know, feminism comes with a lot of types, including radical feminism, social egalitarian feminism, postmodernist feminism. And now we have uh, eco-feminism that we have been discussing in recent times, particularly. And well, for long years, I considered myself as an eco-feminist, but I didn't know about the background uh, of this concept of eco-feminism. But now I know better what eco-feminism is, and I have personally experienced firsthand what eco-feminism could be. And Wandana Shiva is an idol for me. I've been reading from her, and she is like a guide for me. She has been like a guide for me. And Wandana Shiva has this statement which really uh, touches my heart. She says that industrialization and also capitalist exploitative approach wrote about by it um, make people consider nature as, an, as, as a woman to be raped. Wandala Shiva, in her book, there are lots of articles which have guided me and shaped my approach today. And uh, I can see a very intersectional struggle to be put up by women in many areas of work, because ecofeminism touches um, sections in an intersectional way, including sexism, racism, militarism, and colonialism, labor exploitation, sexism, and uh, veganism, and exploitation of animals, in other words. So eco-feminism brings about all these concepts in order to you know, question our work in all these uh, different areas of work. And one of the most problematic areas of work among these would be the exploitation of animals, veganism, in other words. Unfortunately, we couldn't overcome the problems in this area. We have been putting a fight against the exploitation of animals. We have been putting a fight against uh, you know, racism, sexism, but still we have to do more, especially uh, against veganism, you know, exploitation of animals. We have to put it on the top of the agenda that we have today, all of us. Well, climate crisis, climate change acts as a crisis and we need to act quickly against uh, the impacts of this crisis and we have you have to act quickly and rapidly. IPCC International Panel on Climate Change came up with a report and the report is one of the reports is called 1.5 degrees and it, it, it comes up with a lot of important recommendations to be taken up by the by the countries. So it says by 2030, the climate change should be should be fixed at 1.5 de degrees Celsius degrees, and the world, the Earth will not be will not be tolerating more than 1.5 percent of 1.5 degrees Celsius degrees. For that, we need to decrease the carbon emissions by 40 to 50 percent. While the countries are under signing this. Uh, through certain agreements and conventions, but countries are not taking measures after they're signing those agreements and conventions. First of all, we need to leave coal, use of coal, and we need to abandon use, utilization of fossil fuels, you know, and we need to stop using thermal power plants by 2030. This is why there, there are many countries taking decisions on, you know, stopping using of um, thermal power plants. For example, Germany decided to stop using thermal power plants, but still, no, they're not putting pressure enough for, for the stopping of, of use of the thermal power plants. And mining activities have to be have to be abandoned as soon as possible because they're leading to deforestation in the end. And build up construction. We need to say no to construction, new buildings, because all of these new buildings require raw materials to be extracted from the nature. So um, extra urbanization, extra uh, construction, buildings, they have to be stopped. And industrial animal husbandry is another important factor and causes and contributors to climate change. We have to you know, put a restriction, put a limitation on the expansion of livestock activities and industrial livestock activities particularly. And the thing is, when it comes 
to energy production and generation, we are talking about exploitation of resources, natural resources. We need to be very careful about how much energy we really need. And we need to make a planning of the energy production and energy gener generation. Uh, we should not be considering energy production as a source of capital. We need to identify how much energy we really need so that we can produce accordingly. Today, we see that 30 to 40 percent of extra energy generation happens and we have to stop this as soon as possible. And we need to support small scale family farming instead of industrial large scale farms. And also instead of private vehicles, we need to be you know, supporting and encouraging uh, the public transportation you know, instead of um, instead of individual vehicles or planes and all those aircrafts and also energy efficiency policies have to be in place energy is efficiency energy saving related policies have to be in place in order to in order for us to stop the climate crisis and we need to promote um people to buy less and use less uh, our association has a second-hand store, by the way, a clothing store, a store, and I have been buying from that store in the last two years or something. Uh, it's, a, it's a clothing store. I buy second-hand clothes from that store related to our association, and I, I'm not buying new uh, furniture to my, uh, to my house, by the way, I would say, uh, for years now. And we need to promote voluntary sim simplicity. We need to promote using less... And also we need to promote reusing, recycling, and we need to be protecting biodiversity in agriculture, in agriculture as well as in nature. You know, there may be differences between the cultures, but those differences are disappearing among the people. Um, all of us, uh, we go and buy from this cotton uh, store in Turkey, etc. No local stores anymore. We need to go for agroecological um, applications as well and practices as well we need to um, go smaller and smaller you know around the globe these becoming smaller related discussions and debates are going on against expansion expansionist approach of the capitalism and we need to protect our soil and nature from all the pollutants and and the contaminants you know there are lots of international agreements and, and commitments and conventions over there including Rio, Kyoto, and Paris Convention. But unfortunately, there are lots of multinational capitalist um, companies and governments as well. They are they are not being voluntary. They're not volunteering to implement those conventions. Unfortunately, they are not giving upon their their profits they have been making so far. This is why, when it comes to fighting climate change. Uh, this struggle will not be owned by the multilateral and multinational companies or governments. It will only be uh, made, this struggle will only be made by the people themselves. There is this People's Glasgow Agreement I have to make reference to, or, um, signed by more than 200 organizations and agencies around the globe. They say that, those organizations say that it is only them who can stop and hold climate crisis along, along, um, along the road and around the globe. You know, let me talk about also women in front line. There was this Chipko movement I have to make reference to. Um, uh, it started in India, one then she was a country, you know. And back then, this Chipko movement was so much important. People, they hugged and embraced the trees in order to protect their nature and protect their forests uh, from being uh, cut down by the mining activities and mining uh, companies. And back then, women were on the front lines of the struggle. And Navia Pesina. Here as well, women are taking a big role in relation to agroecological practices and also in relation to struggle against gender inequality. Women had an important role in that movement as well. In Turkey as well, women have been in the struggle for a long time, very extensively. Women have been in struggle of life. They have been putting up a fight against the life itself. They've been putting up a fight against gender inequality and they've been caring for home. They've been caring for the farm for the children all of it so they they shoulder the burden of of, of life and uh, this is a picture depicting caricature depicting cartoon depicting um uh, depicting uh, the women protecting their trees against uh, the um against the construction companies who would be cutting down their trees and here what we see again 
women putting up a fight against thermal power plants, mining factories, mining uh, companies, from from very young people to the elderly, they are putting up this fight all together on the front lines. And as the ecological NGOs, uh, we have been supporting those women and we are being with them on the front lines of the struggle. This is a picture from Kazdalere. Uh, it, it is, this is this against the Genghis mining um, company uh, because they are going to do mineral activities of digging up some gold over there. And from each region of Turkey, including Aegean region, Mid region, Mediterranean, Central Anatolia, women are engaged in the struggle to protect their environment, to protect their na nature, to protect their farms, to protect their forests, to protect their, their life spaces. And this is another a picture. Took many people, took many villages and protesting against the dam activities, Gebze women against thermal power plants. You know, all these activities of struggle are becoming successful because they are bringing an end to the uh, to the thermal power plant activities or uh, some activities geared towards felling down the trees. Let me be quick with the pictures. I'd like to show you this picture as well. You know, women, women, they're facing the law enforcement. Law enforcement are oppressing women. Uh, they make no distinction between young people and the elderly. They can you know, drag the women just uh, on the soil and put them in detention centers, you know. And this is a lady called Aisha, Aisha from Black Sea region. Just a moment, please. Uh, my computer is about to die. My battery is about to die. I have to plug it in. And this is from Black Sea region. Genghis Holding will be starting a mineral activity, uh, by the way. Um, and women, they protested against this potential activity of Genghis Holding. And this lady came to the parliament, Turkish parliament, and she was engaged in the str struggle before the parliamentarians as well. As women, in eco-feminist women, we wanted to be organized separately and, and also collectively with those women. And we wanted to, you know, uh, put up this fight against patriarchal structure and, you know, uh, all those uh, panels and meetings are organized, but men are taking place on those meetings and panels. This is why they came together when we established Women Assembly, Ecology, Ecology Union, Women Assembly we set up. And we are to working together with the local women and putting up a fight together with them. And, um, and we also have this uh, phrase in our name, which is LGBTI plus women and women um, platform. So as eco-feminist women, they come together with the local women and international women as well. Uh, we were there in COP26, I have to admit. We were in Glasgow this year in COP26 and uh, for the climate just justice, we wanted to raise our voice and raise our concerns. We were engaged in the rallies, street rallies as well. And you can see some pictures from those rallies. We came together with the feminist women around the globe and we tried to be engaged in networking activities with all those women. That was it from my side. If I have time, may I show you a video of one minute? Do I have time, Miss Lydia? May I have one minute for a short video, please? Mum, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, uh, just a second. Uh, yes, if it is just one minute, uh, yes. we can give you extra time. Uh, we know how enthusiastic uh, right now you are. So let me give you one more minute. Thank you. Okay. You can just present it. We just we don't see anything, Suheila. Öyle mi? 
We don't see yet. or we don't hear anything. Maybe maybe you can put it on the chat. Uh, <laughs> okay. The link. It, maybe we can, we can just see it afterwards if you uh, if you can allow us. Okay, I will load it to YouTube and then share the link. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, thank you, Ella. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, uh, Sehila Doan. Yes, it is incredible. Actually, you just made uh, uh, your presentation with giving uh, examples of uh, Turkey and how the um, the the issue is getting really on the uh, alarming uh, level in in Turkey. And and you you gave us the ecological disasters in Turkey as an example, um, and and the natural disasters, which is all you show us all is related to each other actually and the woman again a victim of it and protester of it thank you very much uh, and um, uh, it's uh, you just call urgent action as professor page called urgent action as well and and you gave us with the cross red cross what we shouldn't do what we need to do and thank you very much so our next uh, contribution comes from Gülin Özdemir Eroğlu uh, let me introduce her as well. Just a second. Yes. Uh, Gülin Özdemir Eroğlu is a landscape architect, project manager of association uh, for support of women candidates, Kader Ankara, and landscape research society, volunteer in women's coalition, Turkey. She has a double master degree in the Department of Earth System Sciences in the Middle East Technology, uh, Techno uh, Technical University and Department of Landscape Architecture in Ankara University, Turkey. She has 10 years of nonprofit organization experience, participatory projected area planning, the role of municipalities in adaptation to climate change and rain harvesting and human rights cities are the main study areas of her and and now uh welcome Gülin Özdemir Eroğlu the floor is yours and then thank you for your uh, uh everybody now we are you know, 136 people are looking and hearing and urgently waiting in action thank you yes çok teşekkür ederim Uri hocam uh, thank you very much Ms. Suriye may I share my screen very quickly just a moment, please. Thank you once again. I'd like to say hello to everyone in the call today. And today, in my presentation, I'll be um, showing you a feminist perspective to climate change decision-making processes on local governments. This will be the title of my presentation, as you can see. Well, first of all, let me walk you through the role of the municipalities and why municipalities I wanted to touch upon, I like to tell you, and why the adaptation to climate change I wanted to focus on. First of all, a big majority of the global population, 55% of the global population today, and expectedly 68% um, by 2050 of the global population will be residing in the urban setting. And uh, the urban infrastructure is not sufficient to host those many people. And energy demand is going up accordingly, as well as the vulnerabilities of the people. And ur urban heat islands are occurring. And there is this effect of urban heat islands. And in this respect, municipalities will be quite important to take a part uh, in solution of the problems. You know, both, you know, cities are both the victims and causes of climate change. This is why I think that uh, the, the changes, resolutions will also, resolutions or the problems will also come from the local governments. That's what I believe in. And why uh, adaptation to climate change? Why did I select this topic, you may ask? First of all, first of all, mitigation, climate change mitigation actions. You can adopt them, but under the best, even under the best scenarios, you need both mitigation and adaptation. And, and also adaptation policies have to be localized, have to be planned considering the local circumstances. This is why participation of the local people will be important when coming up with adaptation, um, adaptation solutions. Well, let me show you some figures and information from the literature. 
Well, uh, the literature looks the gender differences in climate knowledge, attitudes and actions, whether the participation of women will lead to better policies and decisions in the area of adaptation and mitigation to climate change. And you can see certain findings and results from the literature that I'm going to walk you through in a moment. Well, first of all, women. Women are estimated to compose between 60 to 80 percent of grassroots environmental organization membership. And women are more active in environmental reform projects, according to the literature. And women tend to perceive environmental risks as more threatening, and they express greater concerns about climate change than men do. And women consider climate change impacts to be more severe, and women are more willing to change and, and, and move into a more climate friendly lifestyle and women are underrepresented in the area of climate in the area of climate change policy making well women are impacted more by the climate change compared to men by the way there are a lot of activities and, and research out there verifying this finding but you know women are not just victims of climate change we have to admit women should also take an, a very active part in the solution and resolution of the climate change related impacts and problems so in this presentation i had a certain aim in this study i had a certain aim i wanted to investigate the barriers and inadequacies and achievements on climate change adaptation specifically from the conjuncture of 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 of, of different uh, type of local governments in Turkey. In my study that, that I conducted two years ago, I you know adopted this aim. Uh, 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 can can everyone please meet themselves? Can everyone please meet themselves? Well, and I try to understand the causes for the local governments not taking measures properly um, for adaptation to climate change. And I try to see whether the political orientation of the local governments matters or not when it comes to adopting, this, adopting decisions and, and policies in relation to climate change adaptation. Department of Environmental Protection and Control and Department of Parks and Gardens of the Metropolitan Municipalities, provincial municipalities and, and big district municipalities uh, was the target group for my study. I shared a survey, a questionnaire with them, and I kindly asked ask them to fill in the survey. You can see the participation by metropolitan municipalities by 76.7%, a huge participation actually, and 30% from the metropolitan district municipalities. You can see also the political party distribution uh, when it comes to participation and responding in and responding to my survey. When I look at the survey participants' categories, this is how I can categorize them. There is this global covenant of mayors. You know, uh, this this is a this is an agreement signed by the mayors for the European Union to achieve climate-related goals set for the European Union. So I took this covenant as the basis for my survey survey, and I had 18 municipalities that were signatory to the global covenant mayor of, of mayors for climate and energy initiative so i had certain questions about this covenant and i uh, also looked at the female employee ratio in the participating municipalities i had to check the master plans and activity plans of the municipalities to see the female employee figures i wish i could also see the women holding high ranking positions in the municipalities but i couldn't find those but i couldn't find those uh, numbers. So 50 municipalities had female employees between 25% to 45%, and 57% of the seven municipalities had this had these figures, as you can see on on the slide. So what about the results? First of all, municipalities which were signatories to the Covenant of Mayors. The average rate of female employee was 25%. And in non-signatory municipalities, the average rate of female, female employees was 18%. This is not a very huge difference, but a significant, significant one, I may have to say. And another question in my survey was about 
that the municipality said a special unit working on climate change or not, a special department maybe working on climate change. In municipalities with a female employee between 25 to 45 percent, this ratio of having a special unit was 22 percent, as you can see. And we also asked what was their rate of consideration when they evaluate their climate change adaptation activities among uh, their other municipal activities. And what we see is what we see is in municipalities with high female employee ratio, um, uh, this figure went up to 26% and even more. And the last question was about the barriers and inadequacies on climate change adaptation, specifically from the conjuncture of different type of local governments in Turkey. And lack of capacity, lack of citizen demand, and lack of sufficient budget, lack of coordination between units and directorates in the municipality, and lack of collaboration with other municipalities, and lack of uh, lack of and um, lack of certain regulations and legislation, and lack of sanctions or incentives for the central government and local governments. These are the survey results for all the municipalities and you can see this, I mean, no uh, demand by the citizens. So that was ranking the highest and then lack of cooperation and coordination with central local public units and lack of legislation. So um, we also check this across the municipalities with low rate of women employees and high rate of women employees despite the fact that we had similar results when we have a detailed look at the answers provided we see the following picture so uh, those who do not work in the field of climate think that there is not enough demand by the citizens but those who are working in the field of climate did not refer to this as not having sufficient demand by the citizens. So this is an excuse. The same uh, applies to lack of budget at the municipality. It's used as an excuse as well, because in metropolitan municipalities, they say there is no budget problem. Uh, so when they don't work on climate, they refer to budget as being one of the shortcomings, which they use as an excuse. So we can see 90% and 95%, which is the difference that we see across the municipalities. Uh, and it, those municipalities with lower rate of female employees, they use this excuse of lack of demand by citizens in a more frequent manner. And civil society support is also very important in that respect. I also would like to talk about that. Women's organizations in Turkey uh, are working in the field of right to life, litigation process support, gender equality, and also elimination of violence against women. They work on these fronts. Therefore, climate is not one of their priority at the moment. However, uh, Climate change is also related to advocacy in the field of right to life, especially uh, in order to support women to take part, active part in decision-making mechanisms, especially in po politics, women's organizations have a major role to play. So in conclusion, to sum up, I would like to underline the following statements in conclusion. So. A higher participation of women leads to better climate policy. Gender equality has to exist in climate change decision making processes as in every field. And women should take a more active role in climate change policies. Thank you also very much.
just a second. I just voice. Thank you, dear uh, Gülin uh, Özdemir Eroğlu. Yes, um, it is a scientific aspect. You add our um, 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 discussions, and thank you. For you you share your recent um, um, research results and and your findings from your, um, your thesis from your academic uh, research. Yes, and and you uh, you actually come up at the same uh, conclusion that uh, it's it's uh, uh, not a, um, a priority for women organizations at the moment but it should be because you show us and the municipalities shouldn't um, uh, talk about their budget issues shouldn't say that um, blah 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 they need to take in action just actually you you gave us this inspiration as well thank you very much and now uh, the last but not least, the least uh, contribution from Lydia Bernard Jones. She is the passionate about health systems and uh, strengthening, especially related to the inclusion of women and girls. She has served as a government le uh, legion for inclusion and improvement of health policy related to women and girls. In another capacity, she has supported the work in the development and role of national community health worker policy training and evaluation of the program she has also been involved in programs for continued professional development for health professional both pre and in service she is a member of the Soroptimistic international free town and promotes the agenda of women and girls across the country and projects and implement it lydia holds a master degree in international health and Tropical Medicine from University of Oxford, and she is uh, coming from Sierra Leone, if, if I'm not wrong, just uh, the floor is yours, Lydia. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution, and thank you for your patience. Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, can, okay. we can totally hear you. The oh, okay, floor is good. Yours. Thank good, you. thank you. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Um, so I will be approaching this from a different perspective um, from uh, the other speakers. So I am looking at um, ecofeminism and gender equality from a perspective of a service club and sort of especially looking at the context in Sierra Leone. So to start us off, I'll just quickly go over, you know, talk a little bit about Soroptimist International. Um, the context of climate change in Sierra Leone and then the intersectionality of change, climate change and gender, and then what our call for action would be as a club. So to start us off, just to quickly talk about Soroptimus International, as I'd mentioned, um, which is the club I'm proudly part of, is a global volunteer uh, movement. We have over 72,000 um, members, club members in 121 countries. And each Soroptimist club as belongs to five federations. So we have Africa, Great Britain and Ireland, Europe and the America. And a lot of our work is really um, around advocacy on, on grassroots projects related to women and girls and access to human rights. So all of these um, clubs across the different countries and continents that we work in really um, work with grassroots organizations to ensure that women and girls are liberated and um, are prioritized. So as I said, you know, our membership really hones in on grassroots and um, hoping that individuals and collective groups of women and girls can realize their potential and have equal access. So within, Sierra, within Freetown, so Soroptimist in Freetown, a lot of our projects have in the past been involved in uniform projects where we provide school uniforms for um, girls in school because we know that some students do not go to school simply because they do not have enough uniforms. Some people who only have one or two or none at all. So those are sort of bridging the gap. So helping students to have access to uniforms so that they will then get access to education. And then we also support children with disability. These are often groups that are, you know, isolated and often not looked at, especially with mainstream um, um, funding and um, NGO work. So we support them and also nursing and senior homes, which are also a population that are often um, not included and often not thought about. So these have been our work primarily um, with Soroptimus International. Now, just to quickly talk about climate change in Sierra Leone, we've been experiencing a lot of factors and I will talk about how Soroptimus and climate change intersect in the next, in the next but I just wanna present sort of the, 
the context in Sierra Leone. So two major things that are affecting um, climate change in Sierra Leone are the, is the mining sector and deforestation. So um, Sierra Leone has diamonds and bauxite, which so we have a huge mining sector. And that has led a lot, as you can see in the photos, a lot of land degradation, contamination of soil, um, and local streams and wetlands. And then around deforestation, we're experiencing a lot of soil erosion. We have fewer crops, lots and lots of flooding that's being experienced in country. Now, fast forward to 2017, um, we had a mudslide after three days torrential rainfall that happened in, in Sierra Leone, um, which killed about 1,141 people and 3,000 people were left homeless. And this is directly, directly related to factors of deforestation in the country. So poor infrastructure, we, we lack the drainage system. As you can see, all of these areas, just buildings coming up and trees being cut. So all these were the reasons why we experienced this mudslide. And as I show in these photos, flooding and like our drainage systems have just all been crippled by all these um, deforestation and climate change that's, occur that's occurring. So as I said, I'm just reality of what's happening in the lives of Sierra Leoneans. So, and just coming now into how um, climate change and um, gender, how these two then interact. So one of the key things I wanna mention is um, fossil fuels. So most women in Sierra Leone still use charcoal. Um, charcoal is then made from wood which then fuels the continued deforestation. So charcoal is used daily in our cooking and, and in the production of many things within Freetown. And this is similar also with, uh, within the country, which is also similar to timber. So we also use wood um, for cooking, which is continued use not only at home, specifically at home, but also in other industries. Um, and this is a quicker and cheap alternative to charcoal. So again, this then continues um, you know, the deforestation that then continues the cycle that we see. And then in, with mining, another byproduct of mining is that in rural areas, majority of women then get affected, not only with the fact that most women are farmers within um, these regions that have to be cleared for mining, but then they're also at risk with child labor. There are also other forms of abuse, prostitution, gender-based violence that are caused a direct byproduct of um, of mining and these industries happening within the country. So where does Soroptimus International come in now? So we had a call for action in which we saw that, again, where ecofeminism comes in is that women continue to be on the shorter end of the stick when it comes to the effect of um, climate change, deforestation. They not only contribute to it with the use of these um, timber and charcoal within their homes for cooking, but it's also directly related to their liberation. So women, they, because they cannot afford to buy other means or use other means of eco-friendly fuel, we still have to rely on these old forms of, um, of fuel. So you can see there's really a direct link with um, the liberation of women in Sierra Leone and what we need to do in order to tackle climate change. So Soroptimus International then, we came up with a tree planting um, exercise, which not only uses, it's an inter we use technology. So in first, we, we, we supported the planting of trees in nursing homes that we support, so that these trees will then um, protect the soil and the area within these um, homes which we support. And then next, we use technology. So in collaboration with the University of Sierra Leone, we participated in a reforestation project and we planted on one, in our very first day, we first launch of the exercise, we planted over 70 trees. And these are forest trees. And then each Soroptimist member was, had to adopt a tree. And with the use of technology, we got the exact GPS coordinates for our trees. So you receive periodical messages of the progress of your tree. So then you can be able to monitor and make sure that your tree doesn't get deforest, doesn't get cut down. And then you can see the growth of your tree. So um, you can see in the photos that this, these are the exercises that we've been doing within Soroptimus um, International. But again, um, where 
why we highlight the importance of what we've we've done with um, Seroptimist International is that as a woman organization, climate change really affects the population that we're concerned with. So if we do not participate and join in the action to tackle climate change, we're doing a disservice to the women and girls that we continue to support. Because as we say, um, the homelessness, the farming, the timber, the charcoal, all of that is directly linked to the level, to the equality that women are facing, to, the, um, to their livelihood. So we continue to support our work, and this is just the beginning of things that we'll continue to support. So we're, we're really happy to participate in the conversation today, hearing from other ladies who are working similarly in their countries to tackle climate change, to, um, to fight against, to fight to unify our, our women all across the region who are working with, within um, the environment movement. We're so happy to be here and we look forward to you know, um, collaborations in the future. So we want to thank you from Seroptimist International Freetown. Please ask us any questions. We will be happy to collaborate further. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you, dear uh, uh, dear participant Lydia Bernard Jones. Uh, yes, uh, you show us as well. Actually, everything is related with each other. So we need to uh, we need to fight uh, in every location of the universe to, to against the uh, climate change and uh, uh, also the uh, eradicating, uh, eradicating the inequalities between the. Uh, uh, um, uh, all we have facing actually thank you very much and and especially you also uh, mentioned the project and it's a striking and it's interesting project that you are just uh, uh, having and and having your trees and you are uh, you are you have gps in the trees and you we are just one day by day we are just trying to understand the growing level of and, and uh, the, the conditions of our trees so so uh, adaptation of a tree is interesting project. I never heard that. It's uh, thank you very much, and and um, everybody. And now we are more than one hundred forty people, and they didn't leave. Many of them are still there. So uh, actually, you can ask your questions. Whether uh, you can write in the chat. Some questions are already in the chat box, I guess. And if you, no, who you uh, Fatma Hanım. Huru Hocam, yeah. we, will, we will have a question uh, through raising hand. And uh, before Zehra uh, leaving, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because she, she needs to catch the students, so could you okay. please uh, 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 give the floor to the question? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, uh, just uh, it slipped in my mind that Eşitlik için kadın platformu, so woman uh, uh, platform uh, for the equality. So uh, Zehra Arat, uh, isn't it? Zehra Arat is among us and she needs to just catch uh, her students. We don't want to let them, her students uh, go anywhere. So let the floor is yours and you can ask your questions, please. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers, sponsors, and the fabulous speakers for really putting this together and enlightening us all. And uh, also, <laughs> thank you for giving me the first opportunity. I am afraid I'm just going to ask my question and then leave without listening to the answer. And maybe from the uh, recording, I'll uh, get the answer. I have a class in 11 minutes and it's in another building. Uh, well, uh, given the, uh, actually the level of the complications, uh, uh, we usually hear uh, ecology pitted against environmental development. Economic developed sacrifice economic growth and development, and will have some negative consequences, including uh, unemployment, etc. To the best of my knowledge, the ecofeminism and indigenous populations actually bring they resolve this dilemma. There is no trade-off. In fact, as uh, Suela, my old friend. Uh, cited Vandana Shiva that what is called economic development is actually 
not only distracting the ecology, but also the economy itself, our very well-being and ability to produce and, and uh, have a decent uh, life, able to uh, convey this message more effectively and uh, both ecofeminists and indigenous populations uh, is that from the again the our marginalized status coming from that and so how we can uh, show that there is this false there is a false dilemma we can actually uh, address both economic development and which is which can we say sustainable development uh, more effectively and thank you again and excuse me for running I don't want to set a bad example to my students so I have to be punctual bye bye we thank you thank you thank you dear uh, Zehra Ojam. Uh, thank you and and uh, who would like to uh, give their voice and who would like to answer the uh, question the, the, from our uh, speakers um, who would like to just give a voice yeah, i can give a uh, yes short voice yes please uh, Sustainable development, in fact, is a, is a deception and it's a story because there is no such thing. So uh, you take things from the nature and every resource you take from the nature is harmful. So, I mean, we need to be serious about the economic model and what we are doing. And we need to be very firm in our decision. Let's say it's gold mining. Do we really need gold? Why are we going underground and trying to take one gram of gold and to take that to extricate that we spend five tons of water and we degradate the soil? Oil. It's for a metal that we don't really need. So there is a deception in terms of the understanding and the approach used for development, economic development. So there are lots of uh, things that we change quite frequently, the furniture, the clothes. For the open, things are taken off from the nature. In the past, we used to wear wool, we used to wear linen. Uh, there was animal husbandry and also farming. We have synthetic fabric. We use a lot of synthetic products and it is made out of raw materials such as petroleum. We take those materials to produce them. It is not replicating itself. It's not reproducible. So we have some old knowledge that women had and women could uh, be self-sufficient in their small economies and they could develop solutions. Now there are large investments, large projects, and they are consuming all the resources. So we used to have self-sufficient agricultural policy and people could use the agricultural products produced in their region. But I can see there are food products sent to Turkey from kilometers thousands of kilometers away and we have food products that do not really fit our nutrition style and habits so there are artificial creation of the demand so in the field of mining agriculture and industry they want to pump up the demand increase the demand i don't need to eat the bananas coming from africa there is banana in anamur they are locally and this is situation changing in which as well we didn't have the trash containers because there was no waste people had two three goats for themselves and they produced their own milk made yogurt for themselves they had the eggs out of their own chicken but that is also changing that is changing in the rural area people are buying yogurt from the market because animal husbandry is too difficult for them and there are wastes now even in the village so we need to have 
small scale economies that are self sufficient so that we will not consume up all the resources because the resources are limited everything has a limit sustainable development green energy solar energy wind energy all of those those are also colonial fields i mean renewable solar energy wind energy those are also areas uh, for uh, using people's resources. So there is a wind farm next to my village and it's consuming the wetlands and the pastures. So is it really green as an energy generation resource? So capitalism is trying to make more profit and they say we need more energy. So you should do this and that. And they are pumping up the demand and our habits of consumption and forcing us to consume further. So I think we need to question our understanding of consumption and we need to downscale our consumption in order to protect and conserve all the resources and the assets. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, dear Suheila Doan. Uh, I just saw Paige, uh, Professor Paige, uh, uh, she just uh, raised her hand. Uh, are you there, Professor Paige, or, or uh, would you like to add um because she just i i saw her no, uh, I, I'm, hands are i'm still here but i think my colleague kind of covered it all i was going to speak about consumption and overconsumption, but i think we just got a really perfect answer to the question okay thank you very much now consent we have <laughs> okay everybody is agree on the answer and and now um um uh, we we have uh meltam arson uh, arson from um the uh coalition of uh, uh quality uh, woman uh, quality coalition um the floor is yours your question please Thank you, the chair. Uh, I would like to extend my deepest regards to each and every one of you. I would like to thank Red Pepper Association for organizing this event. I would like to thank the panelists and the moderator. Thank you very much for the valuable information you have shared so far. Women's Coalition has been working for a long time with the municipalities in order to monitor the gender equality for such a long time. So every year we select like different themes and we continue our monitoring exercise during the pandemic we selected different themes this year we have different themes that we have selected for ourselves and as underlined by our panelists because of the urgency of this topic for 2023 regarding the municipality monitoring on local level in all the monitoring exercises we are going to focus on environment we are going to include the theme of environment and focus on that quite specifically. Uh, so doing that will also help women and uh, that will also encourage women for local level advocacy and for fostering the advocacy on a local level. Uh, so I also would like to underline that on national and international level, solidarity and sharing of good practices are two most important things. We need to ensure that women play a more active role. Turkey withdrew from the Istanbul Convention, unfortunately, and starting from that moment of uh, publishing and pronouncing its withdrawal uh, by the government, there was synergy all across the world and solidarity all across the world. We are talking about gender equality and we are talking about a topic that has the same effect as gender equality. So we should have national and international solidarity. We should discuss about how to strengthen that further, how to call women to action. There are very good exercises on national level, but how can we spread it out how can we um, spread the action thank you very much once again and this would be my question to the panelists thank you dear Malta Marson uh, and and you also uh, uh, call a solidarity and action and and um, the the NGOs who are uh, in this area in this field uh, fighting for the field it is important now uh, Turkey Baha'i uh, society Susan uh, Susan Karaman I would like to give floor uh, I'm sorry Susan and and uh, Susan Karaman the floor is yours please Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the organizers and to the precious moderator and all the panelists. It was really 
a pleasure to be here. So thank you for creating this space. And it was a very enlightening experience to listen to all these different contributions. So I just wanted to make a very small contribution and then maybe ask a question to the panelists, whoever would like to answer. I'll try to speak slowly for the sake of the translators. Uh, so first of all, when listening to all these uh, contributions, it really made me think that as humanity, right now we are in a collect, we are in such a stage of our collective history that the current arrangements that we have are no longer sufficient in the face of all these threats that we are living today. Because these threats, it can be COVID, it can be the climate crisis, whatever, they are very interconnected. So the integration and the coordination must be uh, further extended. That is what I realized when listening to you. And this concern for the natural worlds that we are speaking about today actually represents an opportunity for us to expand our consciousness, to help us rethink our priorities, just as uh, Suela Anam, she just mentioned. I mean, we have to think of our own lives once again, and we have to gain an appreciation of humanity's collective identity. So maybe in one sense, we should even see this climate crisis as a catalyst for creating a culture of gender equality. So it made me think that when we look at the nature, we really see how interconnected we are also as humanity. I mean, whatever happens in one part of the world, it's affecting the other part of the world and humanity is also as such. Therefore, it gives us to, um, it creates an opportunity for us to reconcile the interconnected uh, ideals of diversity and unity. I think uh, Professor West was also mentioning about this diversity and this idea of that we have to speak with each other now. I mean, it has to go beyond the state negotiations and we need as humanity, we need to speak about these things to overcome these challenges. So I was very inspired by those uh, talks. So I just wanted to appreciate that and thank you for that. So my question would be, um, a few of you mentioned also, Huria Hojam, you said that um, women are victims, but on the other hand, they are also the protesters. And I think um, Gülin Eroğlu, uh, you also mentioned that women, they are not just victims, but they should also be made part of the solution itself. So I just wanted to uh, ask you what you think um, are the unique strengths that women and girls, they can actually bring to this uh, climate action and this natural resources management. Um, of course, this is um, um, it, it is also something that men can bring, but obviously we are seeing here that the women, they are really active and they are protagonists in overcoming this uh, climate crisis. So what do you think their unique strengths are? Because it's kind of a leadership that they are making. So what are their characteristics, their strengths uh, that they are um, bringing to this climate uh, crisis? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Susan Karaman. It, it is really a um, nice question, actually. What is our strength? Uh, the, the, who would like to answer our uh, contributors? Who would like to answer? What's our strength? Why we are um, taking that issue much more serious, much more um, uh, enthusiastic than the men? What, why? Yes, Gülin would like to uh, just answer it. Yes, please. Before giving the floor to Gülin, can we have uh, the picture, uh, please? Can we have the photo uh, of the you know, of panel? Uh, sorry, Thank Gülin, you. for interrupting you. Please, Suryo. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, you are right, uh, Fatma Hanım. Uh, she is always right. And, and uh, without her, we can't have any evidence of our actions. Thank you very much. And could you please just turn on your cameras and can we see you? Bora Bey, did we have the photo? I mean, I took already, but uh, if if you take, I think it's take, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. okay I thank think. you. Thank, sorry, and and thank you very much. Thank and uh, Gillian, now uh, you can just uh, give your answer. What's our strength? Tell us. Uh, 
Teşekkür ederim Huri Hocam. Sözler. Thank you indeed, uh, Professor Huriye, Huriye for giving me the floor back again. May I answer Meltem's question first? I like to answer both questions, but Meltem's question first, because she was the first one with the question. Well, Women's Coalition is an organization of 20 years. It has a history of 20 years, and it has been monitoring and observing municipalities for long years. And in the last one year or so, I have been volunteering uh, in the monitoring activities of this Women's Coalition. And in this year's monitoring, municipality monitoring action, accessibility, access to safe food, uh, and nutrition will also be monitored and the this monitoring action will be undertaken by the local women organizations more than 40 women organizations will be engaged in this monitoring activity and at least 45 municipalities will be observed and monitored and the monitoring action will be kicked off in april around april this way women will be will be looked at from the perspective of poverty violence against women women participation, women's engagement, and also accessibility, access to healthy food and safe food, access to healthy environment. This will also be covered in a monitoring activity, monitoring action. And also climate change will be, will be looked at and how it impacts the women. Well, and this was an answer to Meltem's question about the, the other question, as far as I could remember. What I can say is actually solidarity and empathy and feeling of empathy and, the, and, and solidarity constitute or makes up the power and strength of women. This is what I can say. This is the strength of women, that solidarity and empathy. Thank you very much. That was it. Thank you, dear Gülin. Uh, uh, would anybody add a, a, a more uh, uh, answer for this question? Um, I just saw Professor Pate's hand on. I'm not sure whether it is already on. I'm sorry, Professor, if it is, uh, I couldn't see that well. No, that it was new. I'd like to also um, kind of jump in quickly. I see Lydia's hand is up too, so I won't take much time. But, you know, I, I think that there are important things to talk about in answering this question. And two of them I want to bring out is, um, you know, the first one is that I do think we want to be careful about essentializing, right? I mean, because I think of some of the corporate actors in the United States who are driving the kind of economic transitions that focus on more consumption and growth economies. And those corporate actors are mostly men, but there are women right in there, right? So there's a way in which that we need to disaggregate the question of what we women who are in solidarity thinking about livable futures might have to offer and what women who are in positions of extreme power who are thinking about corporate capitalism and amassing wealth might offer. So just to offer that as an invitation to think about non-essentialist um, discourse. But one of the things that I think women may have to offer that is slightly different than others is, you know, the, the intersecting vulnerabilities that women have dealt with for, you know, for all time. And so I think that if you think about intersections where different kinds of vulnerabilities come together to give people unique perspectives, there are vulnerabilities that women have that allow them to understand the vulnerabilities of others. And then the last thing I'd like to say briefly is that you know, in the part of the world that I work in, the Western Pacific, a key thing that we need to push towards is political participation on the part of women. So if you look at the country of Papua New Guinea, there are currently only two women in parliament, and this is unacceptable. And this is true across the Western Pacific and true in many parts of the world. And so I think before we can get to a place where we really think about whether leadership is going to be different if there's a transition to a more capacious inclusion around gender, we need to think about political participation. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Page. You're right because uh, I, I am coming in another country, not just Turkey. I'm also representing the Norway here, and I know political participation tells a lot in the story because the environment friendly all actions comes from women-led organizations and women-led companies and everything. I totally agree uh, uh, in that point as well. Political participation is also the center of the issue, and and. Uh, Nejla Mahanoğlu, I saw your hands are, uh, is raising. And could you please just uh, ask your questions or give your comments? The floor is yours. Uh, just your, uh, could you please just turn on your, uh, yeah. Teşekkür yes. ediyorum. Öncelikle kırmızı bir Thank you indeed. I'd like to thank uh, Zap Software Association deeply. I'd like to thank everyone for organizing this very nice event. I'd like to thank the moderators. And this has been such a fruitful and productive meeting so far. I benefited a lot from this meeting today. I'd like to ask, I'd like to build upon what Susan earlier mentioned. Well, you know, women, tend to collaboration and are, are inclined to solidarity and collaboration better than men. They're more inclined to collaborate, or more, they're more inclined to be on solidarity. They think about the other people um, before themselves. They, they put other people before themselves. That's what I'm saying. And women put next generations uh, before, before themselves again. They, you know, attach great importance to the rearing, to the growth of the next generations, future generations. And this is a power and strength of women, as I call it. And this is a capability and strength of women. And if women also balance these capabilities with the capability of decision making, then and this this will be to the benefit of the whole world, I believe, and the welfare around the globe will go up. These are the strengths of women, and those strengths have to be more utilized in the decision-making mechanisms and management positions. I believe women will benefit from such capabilities of women to a greater extent if they can hold uh, you know, management positions or decision-making positions. Thank you indeed. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nejla Mahanolo, uh, for your contribution. And Inji Zengiroğlu, uh, I guess, uh, I just saw her hands. Uh, uh, just please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you to Kırmızı Biber Derneği and all the panelists and to you uh, as the moderator. Uh, really, it was an enlightening uh, session. So. Um, as a brief, as, as much as I understood from uh, the speeches, uh, as Paige was nicely uh, put forward that solidarity across countries is needed. It's okay. And on the other side, uh, Suheyla Doan uh, told us that International Panel for Climate Change Report is an advisory report to all the countries. So. On the other hand, Gülin uh, Özdemir Erdoğan told us that there is global covenant of mayors. So it seems that these are all advisory reports. And I'm asking why? Because there is only one Earth planet as our home. It's a unique for all of us. If there is a problem in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, in Turkey, um, it's like the heart attack in the body. So all the other parts are affected. So um, rather than being an advisory report, I think this group should think about how can we make it as a mandatory report? So starting from the countries who are causing the climate change, the, uh, as one of the panelists told us that most of the uh, Northern countries are causing the problem. And uh, starting from all those countries, uh, the major countries, we should ask why you are creating this kind of problem and what are the corrective actions that you are planning to take and what's the deadline for it. So you are causing this damage. If it's like a crime, it's, a, it's like a crime in, in all over the world. So I think the... Um, we should think about how can we make these reports on um, mandatory uh, as a mandatory reports. What can be 
done uh, for the governments to take it seriously rather than being an advisory report. Thank you. Thank you, Inji Zenjirolu. Uh, would you, uh, would anybody would like to give an answer uh, uh, with that point? Uh, I could if uh, not the yes, other Seheyla Doğan. Um, uluslararası anlaşmalar var aslında. We have international agreements and covenants and conventions and states are becoming a signatory to those agreements, but they're not ab abiding by the agreements. For example, Turkey signed the climate, uh, Paris Agreement years ago, but it, not, it did not ratify it in the, in the parliament for years because it did not want to, you know, uh, abide by the limits um, put forward by the, by the convention in, in relation to thermal power plants, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. This is why Turkey did not ratify the agreement for years. Then uh, came this, this uh, prosperity or probability to, to have green credit, green loans. This is why Turkey ratified the, the Paris Agreement in the parliament in order to you know, secure this climate fund or climate loan. Hopefully Turkey will make use of this funding uh, to fight climate change, but I'm not hopeful about it, I have to say. Well, for transnational companies, nature is, is a source of capital, is a source of uh, money making. So if they give up on such investments, then they will have to give up on their profits as well, which they are not willing to do. This is why they don't want to, companies, multilateral companies and multinational companies, they do not want to abide by those conventions and agreements. You know, very quick steps have to be taken by 2030. And extinction is coming, mass extinction is coming up very soon. But, you know, dealing with capital, and dealing with the multinational companies is very difficult. We need a change to the system for us to put, put, a, put up a better struggle against the multinational companies. And what we can do is people, us, we have to come together. We have to come together in order to you know, adopt the slogan of change the system for climate action. We need to fight and to achieve a change to the system. The system is problematic. Uh, those companies and governments, they will not give up on uh, the capital, they will not give up on their, their willingness to emit, green, emit greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases. This is why we need to come together. We need to come together as people in solidarity. This is why I made reference to this People's Agreement of Glasgow. It is people who can achieve this. It is women generally who can achieve this, who can change the system. If feminists come together, if women come together, together with the local actors, we can make a transformation to this whole system. It is in the hands of the women, you know, to change this whole system and advocate for the justice, climate change. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and Nina Smart. Uh, I can see uh, I, Nina. I know, uh, yeah, Nina uh, was uh, raising I, it's her not hand a question. So it, is, it is a reply. Uh, I agree. I totally agree with Suheyla. Uh -huh. uh, there are international agreements. The uh, governments put signature and ratify to the agreements, but they do not implement it. They do not apply it. That is why this year's and the last year's motto uh, for this CSW, feminists want system change. We, we, yeah, we need a system change. As long as the same, same system continues, nothing is gonna change. All these uh, all these commission meetings are intergovernmental meetings, and they produce a recommendation report. There is nothing mandatory. So we need to change the system. Yeah. Okay, tomorrow I we give the full, to change yeah. the system. Exactly, we need to do that. And Nina, uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Please ask thank your you, question. Yeah. And, uh, thank you to all the presenters. It was very interesting. I do have a question for Lydia Bernard-Jones. And um, the project that you presented reminded me a lot of Wangari Matai's work. And she's one of my heroes. And I was just wondering, uh, with the Soroptimist International of Freetown, are you planning to expand this project um, in, in the area or maybe take it to the rural areas? What is the next step and how are you approaching this? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your question. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, 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 Lydia. Yes. So um, 
with the challenges, as we've all mentioned with um, tackling climate change, we it needs money, it needs mobilization, it needs um, coalition. So we've been happy to do it in the, the first launch within Freetown and we are looking for opportunities to get more seedlings, to be able to you know, improve the technology and monitoring the trees that we plant to make sure that behind our backs, they're not um, cut down, which will then create further issues and kind of take the work back. Um, so, really why I said it was a call up for action in our presentation. And I think um, in our questions, we've talked about how, you know, this is why platforms like these are important because then other women who are working in other countries to push the movement for climate change can hear about interventions that we're doing in our countries and our regions and can learn from us and also give us tips on ways to, that we can improve it so that we can then make a difference because we need to make action now and you know it's already too late so we need to we need to move quickly so to answer the question it is yeah we are looking to hopefully get more funds to be able to um, you know cascade this to other regions and also across africa thank, thank you, you lydia now we got a project as well look at guys we have and a woman we have projects over here we can do that and and julian özdemir eroğlu would like to add something um to inji hanım's uh, uh, question and contribution yes please Yes, thank you very much, Huria, Professor Huria. Thank you indeed. Well, very quick, I'll, I'll be making a comment on top of what Sela mentioned indeed. As she said, we need a transformation to the system. As long as capitalism is, is there, you know, the nature will be considered to be something to be exclu exploited. And as this is the case, we cannot find a solution to the problem of nature being exposed to exploitation. Well, there is this struggle of ecology, and there is this article which is entitled Strategy uh, for struggling against, uh, for putting up an ecological struggle. But the thing is, uh, this, this environmentalist and ecological approach should be disseminated. Well, political approaches will not bring a solution to, to this issue. So ecological approach should be there. A change may be to politics, a transformation to policies and politics is needed in this respect to be more environmentalist and ecologist. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make a very brief comment over there. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And, and now we, we have Serap Dalkılıç. Uh, she raised her hand as well. Yes, Serap. Uh, Merhabalar. Yes. Yes, everyone, I'd like to thank Kırmızı Biber, I'd like to thank Ratsma, the moderator, Hürriye, Gülin, Süheyla, everyone, thank you indeed, all the panelists, distinguished panelists, I'd like to thank you all indeed. We've learned a lot, we've learned a lot in this session today. Let me share a, a small piece of information about Turkey. There is this Kızılca Köy village in the province of Aydın. And women villages putting up a struggle against uh, the thermal power plants and the geothermal power plants actually they're putting up a huge struggle and their struggle you know paid off i have to say and these women they set up a theater theater play in their village and they are telling their own stories to the to the people thanks to this theater play and this is a mobile theater play actually they are you know um visiting the, the, the other villages and provinces around the country, and they are talking about their own story to the rest of the, um, the people in the country. They are telling about their, their struggle to the rest of the population. You know, bringing your struggle to the arena of art, theatre is absolutely important. And an Ishit Likji Kadın platform, an Ecolo ecology union of women's uh, assembly we are working together with Sheila and others and i'd like to thank everybody for taking part in this platform and i'd like to thank Sheila particularly for his for her huge struggle in in this in this case thank you very much thank you for your contribution thank you very much yeah it is important actually to bringing art and everything in the issue it is important and and i saw selma ajunar she just raised her hand and thank you for uh, coming and and please the floor is yours 
Uh, thank you so much, Uriye. And uh, I would like to thank Kırmızı Biber Association for this very insightful meeting and also the panelists and contributors for their inspiring statements. I just wanted to touch upon the binding. I mean, I, I, we can say that, you know, we have a binding document in hand, which is um, CEDO recommendation number 37. And it's on gender related dimensions of disaster risk reduction in the context of climate change. And I like this sentence very much, which comes out of it. It says, while climate change affects everyone, those countries and populations, including pe people living in poverty, young people and future generations who have contributed least to climate change are most vulnerable to its impact. Now, indeed, uh, starting with Beijing Plus uh, Five, uh, a Beijing Platform for Action, uh, the critical area uh, K, it, it was on environment. By the time we called it environment, now we call it climate change. And starting with that, we then have Paris uh, Convention and uh, and also very recently the CEDO uh, number 37 recommendation. So we have some uh, tools in hand, but uh, frankly speaking, they are implemented. So this is one problem that we face. And since I took the floor, I just wanted to uh, connect um, climate change where, with girls' education. I think girls' education is both severely impacted by climate change and a key tool to in addressing the crisis. Extreme weather events can destroy school buildings and access routes, cause widespread inter internal displacement and increase levels of poverty and food insecurity. And for girls in particular, increased risk of child, early and forced marriage and unions, as well as, well as unequal domestic burden and increased household cores mean they are more likely to drop out of school because of climate change. Just to give you a data, in if current trends continue by 2025, climate change will be a contributing factor in preventing at least 12.5 million girls each year, can you imagine, from completing their education. And this is a data by Malala Foundation. So this will further entrench gender gaps in education and undermine girls and young women's ability to adapt to climate impacts. So we can go on, of course, with this story, but it comes to the point that, you know, uh, climate change is not really the focus of uh, women's movements all around the world. It seems that we have to concentrate more on that. And as previous speakers have said, we need an international action for that. It's, and it's urgent because uh, gender equality and climate change are, inter, are not separate from each other. And uh, it's not a question, but a suggestion to uh, the panelists and the contributors that how can we go on further for concerted for a concerted global agenda on transformative climate education or building on the uh, COP26, as well as how can we uh, kind of create global accountability uh, on climate change and gender relation. Thank you. It's been a long, but you know, I think this is a very important uh, point. It's a, a cross-sectional issue, and it's in everything that we are working on gender equality. So therefore, maybe we need to focus more. This is a self-critical also to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Salma Hocam. Yeah, yeah, it is really important and, and to, to, um, to do a self-criticism as well now. Uh, Actually, we take we took a step more. So I want to open uh, to to the uh, uh, answer of all uh, contributors. What can we do? How can we move on? 
Do you have any idea? Can I take the floor? Yes, uh, please. Well, as Selma previously stated, actually, we need to come up with new networks, I have to say. No, I am one of the three or, or two women who attended COP26. You know, it was costly and there was COVID-19 because, uh, because of all these, not many women could go and do networking activities in COP26. Uh, 26. I wish there were more women in COP26. I wish we could organize our own women's sessions as women from Turkey. I wish we could organize uh, separate sessions in COP26. We couldn't do it. I wish we could do. We delivered a presentation uh, depicting the struggle of Turkish women in relation to climate change, but it was not, you know, it was not enough you know to do better when it comes to cop 26 we had governments and accredited uh, ngos in one platform and we had another separate platform uh, for us for women movements and others you know there were lots of debates about uh, the about the potential compensation for those poor countries not causing uh, climate change and the president of cop 26 in the end um, had to cry then then announcing the recommendations and findings because they could not decide decide on the uh, compensation for the poor countries which did not cause covid-19 but uh, those rich countries they said that they may be creating the crisis, but they would not be compensating for the poor countries, for the victim, victimized countries, unfortunately. And countries did not decide on allocation of resources for compensating for the poor countries who did not cause the climate crisis in the first place. So what we need to do is we need to do networking activities. We need to be engaged in global actions and global joint actions. And we need to be engaged in more networking activities. You know, there are many women around the globe today in this uh, in this call. I wish we could create a list of email addresses of all the participants today for further networking activities. Yes, you, you can email to the chat and see we have the existing fund. We can have an email group. Why not? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, yes, we can. Uh, this this can be a first step for an, an action for, for, for with that uh, seminar, with that panel, we can write our uh, emails on the um, chat box and, and we can create a network. We can start. Why not? Today is the day. And, and uh, uh, um, thank you very much. Well, it is really, uh, okay. We already shared our emails with you before participating in this meeting, Mum. But for those who do not share their emails, maybe they can type it in the chat box. Thank you. And and, and thank you, uh, everybody. It is a really inspiring um, uh, action and inspiring event that uh, Fatma Hanım, thank you very much uh, for uh, gathering us uh, around the issue and, and for contributions and uh, for panelists and, and for questions. And still two hours later, more than 100 people around this event. Thank you very much for your patience. And, and I would like to give floor to the um, um, Fatma, I touch. Uh, she is the, the 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 main person who is holding us together. Thank you very much. Rio Jam, thank you very much. But as far as I see, Nejla Hanum uh, raised her hand. Oh, I'm Nejla sorry, Hanım. I didn't please. see. Yes, please. Very quickly, maybe, I beg your pardon, but I have to build upon what Suheyla said previously. Uh, Suheyla and others, they said we need a transformation of system, a change to the system. I have to agree totally, but there are two processes which have to go simultaneously. One is from top to bottom like international networking and meetings and the other one is from bottom up you know we have to have the bottom up activities as well gulin call it local governments maybe and let me make an addition to what gulin previously mentioned about local governments you know what makes civilizations and systems is civilization is individuals uh, organizations um 
and, and, and institutions. You know, all of these have to come together for a change to the system. The mentalities of the individuals and organizations and institutions have to change for a change to the system. This is why we need to empower, uh, particularly local governments, as the agents of change at local level. If they can start changing the system at local level, if we can empower them at local level, they can start changing the system at local level, and this change can go up all the way to, 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 to the upper levels of the pyramid. I'd like to thank uh, everybody, Qatar particularly, for supporting women candidates uh, from bottom up. They have been supporting women and they are uh, struggling, putting up a struggle for putting women, women candidates in the important positions from bottom up. So I just wanted to make such a quick and brief addition. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I'd like to thank Fatma uh, for, for invitation and for bringing us together once again. We benefited, benefited a lot from this meeting. Thank you indeed. Thank you, uh, Nejla Hanım. And, and I would like to thank our interpreters. They are the heroine of tonight, actually, because without them, it is not uh, possible to have this conversation with that smooth, with that uh, uh, success. Thank you. And Fatma, Hanım, thank you, maybe for your closing remarks, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Horyoja. Yes, I would like to thank everyone, everyone who are being with us here today. Uh, and uh, for our speakers, they contributed a lot. There are lots to say, but uh, all our speakers said uh, the, uh, the necessary, that they made their, their necessary comments. I really appreciate all of them. As I said, uh, we wanted to have today uh, examples from the world, examples from Turkey, from local government, from national government. I think we did all of them. Uh, let me remind you something. Uh, yesterday, uh, last year, today, we were having the same panel for Istanbul Convention and <laughs> because our government just quit, uh, were just quit from Istanbul Convention and we were having the same panel in the CSW 65. Some of our speakers are already uh, in this panel. I can see Hülya here. Uh, and you know, we had more than 300 people because everyone in the, uh, CSW, uh, CSW, all the organization wanted to know what is going on in Turkey and wanted to have what is the Turkish women's women are doing. So uh, from there we came uh, today. Uh, our struggle is still continuing. Uh, this climate change, as I said at the beginning, is a gender problem. I mean, we are looking for a gender equal world. Before having gender equality in every area, there is no solution. Without leaving anyone behind, we need to work, we need to struggle for gender equal world. I mean, this is the last thing I would like to say. We are closing our panel here. Thanks for everyone. Thanks for our speakers. We will keep in contact. We will have all your emails. We will form a group and uh, we will add uh, all of them. Uh, and uh, we will put the uh, uh, re re recording to the YouTube, but let's, let's see first uh, how, how, how is the recording. Uh, and thanks to our uh, translator as well. Uh, this is all I will say. Have a good, uh, have a good evening, have a good uh, afternoon, have a good day, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you and, and all the representatives from UN, all the groups represented in UN, I'd like to thank you all for your support so far. Hope to see you soon. We'll be in touch. We'll be collaborating. We'll be struggling all together. We have to struggle all together. Thank you very much. Ms. Huria, thank you very much for the very nice moderation. We can stop the recording, by the way. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.
Thank you very much.